Welcome to Paley Front Row, part of the Paley at Home series presented by City. Women have to overcome more obstacles to reach the top. It's made them fiercely determined and more innovative. Just because they can navigate the obstacles doesn't mean they should have to. City is committed to investing in opportunities for 10 million women globally by 2025. so much for joining us tonight. I am very excited for tonight's conversation with our cast and some of the creators and uh, creatives behind Queen Sugar um, for what is sadly the final season of our, of our beloved show. So let's get started. I am excited to have us first up uh, welcome Shaz Bennett, showrunner and executive producer of Queen Sugar. Up next, we have the amazing Tammy Townsend. Y'all know her as Billy. <laughs> um, and then up next, we've grown up with him, I feel like, over all these seasons, Nicholas Ash, AKA Micah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah of course. Up next, we have the incomparable Bianca Lawson. <laughs> <laughs> right, this whole situation. Um, and up next, we have Hollywood, Omar Dorsey. Omar Dorsey in the house. Welcome, Omar. And you may know her as either Aunt Fi or Tina Liffer, but Tina, you're up next. And last but certainly not least, we have our composer for the series, Michelle Nagiacello. Neg Neg yeah. Wow, what? What a group. Like, I'm just going to give y'all a moment. Everyone needs to take their pictures. I mean, look how beautiful. How amazing. Thank you all so much for joining us tonight. Um, I am excited to have this conversation. Uh, especially given that this is our final season of Queen Sugar. So I feel like um, this, is a, this is an extra special moment. Um, I think that the reason that you all got such a, a resounding welcome when you all came is that this show has come to mean so much for so many, I think, across seven seasons now. Why do y'all think that is? What is it about this show that has just really resonated and, and captured such an engaged audience? No, it... Um Everybody can feel all the characters because they know all the characters. Mm -hmm. That's my cousin. That's my son. That's me. Yep. Like when I watch it, I watch uh, Ralph Angel, and I said, "That is me when I was 23 years old, mm -hmm. confused, and, you know, trying to work it out." You know, you see Aunt Vi, you see Hollywood, like, "Oh, that's my mom and my dad, or my uncles." Or you see Bianca, you see Darla, you see Micah, you see when when you see Billy or you know any of us, it's familiar. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's why it resonates. Yeah. And the writing is amazing, Chaz. <laughs> <laughs> the show connects us with love. Yeah. Yes. There is, there is something about family sticking together, whether you come from a family that did that or you didn't. There is something about the notion of unconditional Ride or die love. Mm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, y'all are beautiful to look at also. So yeah. <laughs> but I, yeah. um, and also, I think that, you know, there's so many elements of this show. I think the, the setting in New Orleans, the music, the sound, the, the auditory experience. Um, Michelle, I would love to hear from you. How did you, I, I just feel like that's like one of the main things people talk about with Queen Sugar. Did you expect that that was going to be such a big part of the show? Tell me a little bit about how you created this auditory experience throughout seven seasons. Um, visually, it's very stimulating. It is nice to watch 
these beautiful people for hours on end. <laughs> um, but I think in the first season, I was really, I'm really a huge fan of, of Nova, the Nova character. And yeah. Rutina, personally. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think at the beginning, I was captured by her cadence. And if you notice in all of the characters, they all have a specific timbre and way of speaking. And so in my mind, I thought, if you turned off the TV, which you don't want to ha have happen, but if you were listening to it with the music, that they would complement each other and sort of draw you into the story. And then Ernest, the first season, also sort of Ava guided us in sort of what his sound would be, and that's kind of what was the spark. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm. That's beautiful. That was like poetry. <laughs> I know. <laughs> 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 no, 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 no. <laughs> truly. That's an artist network. <laughs> right, truly, yeah. truly. I would like to know what instrument you affiliated with me. <laughs> <laughs> well, no. The flute uh, horn. Well, <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> Well, no, I just did the amazing scene for this yeah. last season that I can't tell them about. Right. right? Where you have a come to, you come to your mm -hmm. presence of the now and letting go. And so I scored that particular scene. And I hope you like it. I, I think I've brought air and uh, gravitas to your feelings. Yeah. Wow. I mean, <laughs> I'm sure I'll like it. Oh. Wow. Um, I'm like, can you write me a scene? Right? Exactly. Uh, um, Tina, I would love to talk to you about the character of Aunt Vi and just, um, she, I think, has just become so beloved as a black woman, but also just the, the way she's portrayed with so many layers. What has it meant for, to you to play her for seven seasons now? And, um, what do you what do you hope is the legacy that her character leaves behind? Yeah, you know, um, I can't talk about Aunt Vi without uh, speaking to her origin. So, Oprah Winfrey was positioned by the universe to own a network. <laughs> she and Ava hooked up, mm -hmm. and the respect and mutual excitement allowed them to collaborate. And there's no way that an Aunt Vi, a woman over 60, would have been mm -hmm. in anyone's mind, and certainly not as a fully rendered character. Yeah. Queen Sugar is the first time in the history of television that you have seen a black woman or a woman over 60 yeah. fully rendered. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Right? Mm -hmm. yes. And so that in and of itself is historical and not just for the history books, but for the cellular experience, Whew. Yeah. right? Yes. <laughs> and that's what people are responding to. They're responding to the I see you, oh my gosh, I see myself, I see my mother, I see someone I love. But also, it speaks to the possibility, mm. right, of who we are and where we can go and that we don't have to be consigned to small spaces. Yes, mm. yes, wow. <laughs> <laughs> yes, all the awards, all the awards. <laughs> um, similarly, Omar, I think that Hollywood has um, also, I think, had such an impact for being such a, um, a fully rendered character. Um, tell us a little bit about your relationship with this character and some of the feedback that you've gotten about him over the years. You know, um, I've never seen Hollywood on television before, yeah. much like Aunt Vi, you know. Um, you know, you see black men being hyper-reality. You see black men being drug dealers, athletes, maybe doctors, you know. But to see just a common man mm -hmm. who loves his woman, yeah. And that's, and that's all he needs? Yeah. We've never seen that before. I've seen it in life. Hollywood, just so all of you know, is uh, based, in my mind, um, Ava said she wrote it for me. I don't know why, because I was like, I was nothing like that when I met her. <laughs> <laughs> but I think she saw something inside of me. So what I based that on is my brother, my late brother, may he rest in peace. Mm. Um, that's the type of man he was, the cadence that I used, the, um, you know, just the, the slowness of him taking everything in is a lot like my brother, um, Oliver Dorsey. Um, so I wanted to honor him, you know, mm -hmm. on that. So 
anytime you see Hollywood, you see pieces of Oliver Dorsey, and you see the man Omar Dorsey has become seven years later after saying those lines and playing that character. Wow. For sure. Wow. wow. Chills. Um, Bianca, Darla has really, I mean, we first met her in the parking lot in season one, and she was, you know, going through some things. Um, but I feel like her character has had such growth throughout all, all seven seasons. What has it been like portraying someone with so many ups and downs who has really grown into a completely different woman than she was seven, seven seasons ago? Mm. She's almost like a labor of love. You know, she's a challenging, but in a beautiful way, she challenges me um, to dig deeper always. Um, and it's a gift to get to play a character that uh, has so many layers and so many nuances. And when we first meet her, she's all on her own and she's just trying to, you know, make it one more minute, um, get a job in a parking lot, have a trailer, see her child. Um, and then she, fights through it and she um, really steps into her power and builds this life and in the beginning she's all alone. She doesn't have any help, you know? And um, so there's that resilience and, um, you know, she's probably the most personal character for me. Mm. And so, you know, I, I always get like emotional talking about her because it's, she reminds me of people that I know and, um, and I just feel very honored that they're allowing me to do it in a way that feels very um, authentic and truthful and honest. And she's probably the number one character that people come up to me and say that, uh, thank you. So, yeah. Yeah, I see why. I mean, she's, she's been so meaningful, just like all, all of your characters. Um, Nicholas, I mentioned when you came out, I feel like we grew up with Micah in a lot of ways. And I'm curious for you as an actor who's also kind of come of age, I feel like during this journey, what has it been like growing up and growing into this character as he also grows up? Yeah, it's been uh, a cathartic experience, really. Uh, as Micah and many of the characters were grappling with uh, the storylines on the show, it was all happening in real time. So when you see these characters grappling with COVID, we were filming that in the midst of this new unprecedented time in our lives and got to channel all of those complicated, unresolved emotions into the show. And uh, as Omar said, I got to learn a lot from my character. You know, this season especially, Mike is grappling with legacy and what he wants to leave behind as an artist, what he wants to say. And I feel like that spearheaded my ambitions as an actor now leaving this show after seven years. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. Um, I wanted to ask you, Tammy, I feel like a lot of the folks in the cast have been, were together in the beginning and then you came on as kind of a newcomer. What was that like joining the show and what was it about Queen Sugar that, that drew you to want to join this cast? Well, first of all, um, well-written, Ava, Oprah. I mean, I mean, <laughs> right, enough <Yeah>. said. <laughs> but I actually worked um, for Oprah before. I had a show before and, um, and she, just the way that she takes care of her actors is like, it's superb, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and she always puts quality stuff on air. So it, it was a no brainer for me. Um, but when I came on, uh, my first scene was uh, when I'm discovering, trying to figure out what my, what's going on with my father. He's at the hospital and I get these people that are, are there and they, are they running his life? Did they put him there? Did they, you know, so I'm coming in, just guns blazing. I always talk about this. It was my very first scene there. I was so nervous. All these people are amazingly talented actors. And I'm like, they ain't gonna like me. I ain't gonna be good enough. I'm gonna get fired on my first day. Um, but after I did the, the first take, they were like, okay, girl, okay. All right, you might be able to stay a little while. <laughs> but they really embraced me. And uh, I already talked about Tina. Tina was the first person to just come up and be like, you know, um, it's all love here. Take your time, no pressure, you know. And she's also a prankster, which is something I <laughs> very much can, re <laughs> can relate to. So I, <laughs> I know I probably got on their nerves a lot, but you know, <laughs> they tolerated it. So, and Shaz, um, yes. <laughs> Um, I, I love that we're like, yes, pranksters, yes, we love it. Um, 
Shaz, I'm curious, so do you mind sharing with the audience, because you were a director and then now you're showrunner for this final season, you've, you've kind of done it all behind the scenes, mm -hmm. um, you've done amazing work. Will you just share with the audience a little bit about your journey with Queen Sugar and what has, how has it impacted you as a creative behind the scenes? Yeah, well, <clears throat> I'm one of uh, 42 director, women directors on the show. Woo! Um, yeah. <laughs> 90, 94 year, years of television, I'm only one. That's all women directors, so I think, you know, if there's 94 more, then we maybe reach a little parody. Um, <laughs> but, you know, Ava tracked you know, handpicked all of us. So I was hustling, trying to get a job as a director <laughs> in television. And in season three, I got the call to come and direct. Um, my first day was like very intense. I had a very intense episode, my first episode when Remy and Nova go out on the lake and it was a very, I don't, I know. <laughs> but what I, but when I came on the set, what I really loved immediately is everyone, like, from grips, PAs, all the actors, everybody cares as much about this family as you guys do. Like everybody had an opinion, wanted to tell me about what was important, you know. Like, <laughs> and I, I love that, you know. Like it's a really, truly is a family. Like I start as a fan. Like I, when started season one, I was just watching, just like, oh man, I hustled. I was emailing Ava like every couple of months, ever an opportunity, I sure would like to direct on the show. <laughs> she says it wasn't too annoying, but I, you know, was, you, know you gotta speak up. <laughs> so, I, so I came on season three and that was an incredible experience. I love that whole episode, I love that season. Um, you know, a couple of years later, um, I started writing a different pilot with Ava about, it's hopefully a queen sugar, but set on a reservation and, um, Ava brought me on as a writer last season, um, and Anthony Sparks was a, show, was a showrunner, and, and then this season she brought me on as the showrunner, and we met in the summer, and she had an idea where she wanted to end the show. She started, she wrote and directed episode one, and she wrote and directed 713, and so, you know, a part of my job was just to channel my inner Ava, and like, make sure that we, that, you know, it was, I, honestly, I'm so honored to be here, and I felt so much pressure to because I love them as much as everyone here and I just wanted us to have a good ending like I just yeah. was like oh, please just make it a good ending you know <laughs> it's, and I, so far it's been amazing yeah. <laughs> speaking of the ending I know you guys can't share any spoilers but if you had to describe the finale in one word how would you describe it for us Without giving anything away. Resolution. Ooh, okay. Resolution. Ava always says satisfying. Mm. Sure. Sure. Satisfying. And legacy, I think. Yeah. I legacy. Keep thinking about legacy. Like, where's this family? That's like three What's or four words. Right? It was. <laughs> like, you got enough. And, uh, <laughs> He's like, and. Um, I want to hear about the favorite moments, but I'm curious. Uh, I know, Nicholas, you just mentioned you guys filmed during COVID. Um, what were some of the more challenging scenes for each of you guys to either to work on or, or to film? Because there's been a lot of tear jerkers on this show, I have to say. It was what, the day we started filming, that was what, season five, I believe? Five. Yes. That was season five. The day uh, I was slated to go to set, I got news that my mother had passed mm -hmm. away, yes. which was just a very, like, I talked about the experience being cathartic, but how do you channel that? How do yeah. you accept that? And I remember going to set, and, you know, Ava encouraged me. She was like, go back to New York, be with your family. I was like, I am with my family. You know what I mean? There was, at the time, no place that I would rather be than there. And I didn't tell the cast for a long time. And they were still offering me hugs and encouraging words without knowing that I was grappling with this very heavy thing. So that was, that was um, difficult. And she was a big fan of the show. She would always ask me, you know, what's happening? And, you know, she didn't know. Um, yeah, that was, I think that was a, an intense moment for me. Yeah. yeah. The borderlines are like family in real life. Yeah, yeah truly. Yeah, that's, that's great Truly. To mm -hmm. uh, what about you, Michelle? I'm curious from an auditory perspective, of, like having <laughs> to score these very intense scenes, hmm. if there was any that favorite? were like, yeah, or a favorite. Hmm. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm um, what Nicholas said, I feel it in my body. Mm. Sorry. Um, 
I mean, personally, um, I like I like the sad scenes. <laughs> yeah. Um, especially with Darla, um, I really have a those are sort of my favorite. And uh, anytime uh, Nova is with an, a, you know a potential love interest, I, I enjoy those scenes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We got a Nova fan over here yeah, for yeah. sure. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Um, what legacy do you all hope that Queen Sugar will leave behind when you know people are writing about the show ten years from now and looking back on the tenth anniversary of the finale? Um, what do you What do you think that people will be saying about the show? I remember when I was in elementary school, we did this activity where we all stuffed a box with what we thought we would want our future selves to dig up, you yeah. know, and we put in like little pieces of things. I think Queen Sugar at its best is a time capsule of what 2016 to 2022 has been for us. And when I say us, I mean us. I think that people can look back at this time and really know what it felt to be alive during these presidencies and these you know, policy changes in government and know that it wasn't an experience that was fraught with just like, oh, woe is me, I'm black and it sucks, that it actually was juxtaposed with extreme amounts of joy and success and celebration. And that's what I'm most proud of, that I get to show my children and they get to show their great, 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 great grandchildren that we were here. And this was a really pivotal moment and a shift in what it means to be black in this country. Wow. Yeah. Yes. Put that in my body. That's yeah, right. Yeah. Us. Nicholas is dropping them gems. Yeah. Anyone else? I mean, who can follow that? <laughs> <laughs> Tina? You gonna follow it up? Go ahead, Tina. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Tina Lip. <laughs> you, you know, um, I think that, that what Nick says about we were here I think that's what we all want, is to be seen. Mm -hmm. And we also are, are at a time in our country and, and in the world where people need hope. And people want, they, they're reaching for something that can help them stay connected to an idea of what's possible, and not just possible for our own small life, but what's possible for our humanity. Mm. And the border loans represent humanity. Mm -hmm. The border loans and how they connect to community and to one another speaks to something that is very deep inside of us mm -hmm. that wants to be wants to be known, mm -hmm. wants to have freedom. And I think that when we look back, um, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna draw a parallel to uh, Queen Sugar and Friends. Friends hit, you know, the, the airwaves and the consciousness at a time where, you know, young people were really trying to figure it out. Mm -hmm. And Queen Sugar hits at a time when family and community and nation are trying to figure it out. She's trying to get you an Emmy. She's, she's like, let's do it. Um, I, can I just also, yeah. just as the, uh, I also think the legacy of the women directors is gonna be a big thing. Oh, like, yeah. You yeah. know, <laughs> Ava, you know, she really had a vision that was, you know, six years ago, it, she got pushback, like, yeah, really? Like, all women directors? And now it's like, if you don't have women directors on your show, mm. like, that's not okay, you know? Mm. So, like, that's a big paradigm shift. Like, mm -hmm. she really yeah. did change the game in yeah. that yeah. mind. Absolutely. <laughs> um, I would like to say, <laughs> if, that's, if that's okay. Of course, of course. <laughs> in terms of legacy, just to relate it to the show, and also to say that there's so many characters I can relate to. Um, I come from people who are mostly domestics. Um, and I've gone further most than any of my relatives. And so 
when Queen Sugar was offered to me, it came at a time where it was, it was pivotal. I didn't want to tour. It was, I'm, I'm aging in a different way. I wasn't sure what it was I was going to do with all the ideas in my head. So for me, in terms of legacy, it's began my building of generational wealth, right. just to be honest. And um, that not, it's not only employing women, it's just everyone, as they say, it's just this incredible unit uh, community um, that she's using to create new mythologies, new ideas, new ideologies, you know. <laughs> Uh, it's it's just beyond uh, the scope, and I think yes, decades from now we will look back, and it's it's going to be different than Norman Lear. It's going to have we're going to have different feelings. Yeah. It's going to yeah. be different yeah. than yeah. Sanford and Son. It's yeah. just the, it's going to be a good archaeological find. Yeah. Yes. You know? Wow. Yeah. Shout out to Miss Winfrey and Miss Duvernay. Um, <laughs> Each of your characters, I feel like all through the seasons has had a little bit of a glow up in their own ways. I feel like um, visually, like the just the costumes, the, the looks, um, I feel like Darla especially. Uh, tell me a little bit about, did any of you guys have input on your characters and, and their looks throughout the seasons? And it, it, was there any input that you guys had as far as developing them and how they appear on screen? For me in the beginning, I just, what I loved and how I kind of envisioned her in the beginning. I, you know, I didn't want to have any makeup on. Just, I would have just come in with like a messy bun. I wanted her to really look like someone that was just, you know, going to the store in the middle of the night and just trying to stay sober. And I loved that they let me do that. Because sometimes on TV, it's like, what, no, you know? Yeah. But they let me really just kind of like, let her be very, very real and very, very raw. Um, and so that, I loved that. And it, yeah. and, it, and it helped me, you know, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it helped you be in character. Yeah. <laughs> what about Aunt Vi? I feel like she's had some memorable looks through the seasons. <laughs> well, you, you know, um, someone asked what it was like to work with Ava. Mm -hmm. And from season one to where we are now, Ava DuVernay's life has <laughs> right? And so um, Ava directed um, the premiere episode, and, and she wrote and directed, and she wrote and directed the finale, mm -hmm. this, the, the series finale. But in between, in every fitting, Ava was there. Mm -hmm. She wasn't there physically, mm -hmm. but Ava looks through and has a, you know, um, a resonance with these characters. And if she sees something that doesn't feel like that character, it's flagged. Mm -hmm. And what's really, what's really beautiful is, you know, that, um, that my vision of, of Aunt Vi and Ava's vision of Aunt Vi are in sync. Isn't that nice? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I mean, it's, I, it's a joke, but it is nice because yeah. if it weren't in sync and she is such the force behind it, then that could have been, you know, a point of contention. Mm. But when, when I put something on and it's like, I hope she picks this, <laughs> and that's right. that's what she goes with. Mm -hmm. It's like we're we're dancing together, <laughs> even though I don't see her. Yeah, yeah. 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 Wow, that's great. even like on the, in the finale where you brought up that outfit that you remembered from like three three episodes before. Because Ava's like, I don't like this one, and and Tina's like, Oh, but I had this other costume. Like I swear they have it, and like it was brought on that day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. They they know each other. We needed it in that moment, yeah. you know? <laughs> it was a problem. And then because of the history, it's like, yeah. I know somewhere in my closet this <laughs> if outfit exists. <laughs> um, speaking of the finale, I know you guys are all here tonight. We were talking backstage. You have some events together. But I'm just curious, what was it like filming that finale and saying goodbye to these characters that you've, you've lived in for so long? Oh, my goodness. You know, um, <laughs> I just remember the last scene. <laughs> We were in my favorite place <laughs> in New Orleans, Harris Casino. 
<laughs> and Ava, <laughs> serious. And Ava wrote that. I know she wrote it. She told me, she said, I got something special for you. So when I read it, I was like, ooh, we get to shoot the last scene <laughs> in the casino. And, um, you know, just that, it felt like that was, that was like, this is a gift for Omar. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but like that finale, man, that was, it, it was just so beautiful. The whole thing, about, I can't wait, man. I can't wait because I don't want it to end, right? Oh, yeah. You know, we got what, seven more episodes, six, seven more episodes left. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, man, you know, you got that good piece of cake. You just like, I don't want to eat that last little bit. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's, it's like that, but man, that finale is, is is delicious, man. Yeah. I cannot wait, man. I mean, and the, even the all leading up to it is, is that way, man. Um, but yeah, we got some good stuff this season. I am not even gonna. I don't even front, man. Yeah, you, you put your foot in this one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know what that means, Shaz? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> 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 it was, I, I thought it was really emotional. I, I cried. I was just there as an observer and support for Ava, but um, like every scene, it was like, this is the last time we're going to be around Vi's table. No, no. <laughs> this is the last scene we're going to be in the diner. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just like, every, all those sets are our, our characters, and they're, they're, we all know them so well. That was, mm -hmm. every, well, last time we were on the farm. <laughs> Last time I have to go to Vashri. Vashri's <laughs> far away. It's like 45 minutes outside. Yeah. It's they have to get there at four in the morning, so it's yeah. real hot. <laughs> That's really pretty out there. <laughs> That's the only thing about Queen Sugar that I, I can't say I didn't like, but it was not my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> the commute time. <laughs> well, and being outside in July. Oh, in, in New Orleans. <laughs> in the bugs. In, in the bugs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Wow. Um, before I get into uh, questions from the audience, uh, all of you guys have amazing careers um, now in the past and ahead of you. Anyone have anything that they're working on up next that they're excited about? What's next for each of you? Everybody guys? go see Halloween Ends, comes out next Friday. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Do y'all kill him in this one? I think so. Okay. <laughs> I think we get him. I think we get Michael Myers. Yes. Yes. Tell me about power. Oh, and I'm, I'm on Raising Canaan that comes yeah. on. Yeah. 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 Anyone else got something to plug? Now's your moment. <laughs> I actually booked something, but I'm, I don't know if I'm allowed to talk well, about it. I'm a word. I'm a you know, you, I don't know how you know. It really is Hollywood. He like knows everything. He's like, I know about your job. I know about your little job I'm trying to keep it quiet. But I know. I know too. How did you? Oh, we have the same agent. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yes, okay. All right. It sounds exciting. Yeah. It is. I, I think it's going to be. It's gonna be yeah, tremendous. I'm pretty. It's gonna you think so? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah I read a so. couple of scripts. It's really good. Um, anyone else? I have two new recordings coming out. <laughs> on the Blue Note label. So yes. look for that in December and January. Yes, yeah. awesome. awesome. Can't wait for that. Thank God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exciting. Yeah. Um, well, we have a question from a Paley member named Natalie Noblin. Um, she wants to know if, um, I will be, I, maybe this is a question for Shaz or any of you guys. Um, she asked, is there a specific reason why Charlie Bordelon's child, Michael, was changed from daughter in the book to a son in the TV series? That's an Ava question. Mm, yeah. That might be, yeah. You know, I, that's, I'm stumped. I don't know the answer yeah. to that. That's I know right. that, I, I think it might have been um, casting. Like, I think they were reading different people and fell in love with Nick. Um, I'll take that. <laughs> Let's go with that. Like it says, Nick was meant to be in the role. That's fine. Yeah. Um, all right. You know, Darla was only supposed to be on for like yeah, five episodes. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. She's dead in the book. Yeah. 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 Oh, wow. I did not Darla know was that. She was only. The mother of Blue is dead in the book. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Oh, right. I feel like I did hear this. Yeah. Like, and then now she's there through season seven. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. That's she amazing. lives. <laughs> And, and Darla started casting, <laughs> meaning lost, disconnected from herself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, when the show started, she had come back to herself. Oh, she okay. I changed my mind. <laughs> 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 All right. So 
I'm going to open it up to audience questions. Oh, oh okay. Yes, good timing. All right, we got a microphone coming down. I loved you, Nicholas, in Quarable. I saw it twice with Jeremy and with John. Yeah, thank you. And he actually directed Choir Boy in New Orleans this year, too. Amazing. Yeah, and amazing. it was better than it was on Broadway. Broadway. Yeah. Fantastic, <laughs> fantastic. Thank you. you were an amazing James Cleveland. I grew up yeah. to him. Um, thank you. I'm sorry I'm taking so long. I need it. <laughs> thank you, Miss Indigio Cello. When I was younger and I felt weird, I listened to your music and I didn't feel <laughs> as bad. Yeah. And lastly, to um, Auntie Tina, um, because women for my life have been the center of my universe, um, and I'm very protective of black women in my life, beside me is one of the most important women in my life. Um, what was it like from a place of arc, allowing Hollywood, I tweeted and posted one night on social media, if Aunt Vi, if she just don't let this man love her. <laughs> What, what, what was it like? Um, because I was raised by women like you, and they had a lot of fire, and they fought for it. So, what was it like fighting for for all of that within the arc of um, Envi? You know, that's such Good a question. beautiful question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful question because uh, in this world, in this country. There's so much armor that has, you know, that people suit up in, and that heart gets tucked away really, really deeply. So deeply that you don't even know that it basically has no, sun, so, no sunlight to it. You're so busy doing, doing, doing. Mm. And again, it's just one of the brilliant ways in which Ava you know, has her pulse on the emotional, um, you know, emotional pulse of our race, of our humanity, and of this country. And you're absolutely right. I think there was, um, I, I, don't, I don't know if it was season one or season two, where Vi and Hollywood had this sort of estranged time. Mm -hmm. And the scene where Vi is lying on her bed and she speaks to Hollywood for the first time in a long time and there, there are tears. That was the beginning of her thawing because his absence let her know mm -hmm. that there was something that she needed to do in order to truly be happy. And letting this man go was not an option. Mm. <laughs> and so I think that one of the most important things that any of us can do or, or hold on to or, is grab a hold of a want. Because if you want something, if you really want something, then you are willing to do what is necessary to have that thing in your life. Ooh. That is a pull quote right there. Um, let's go to this side right here in the floral shirt. I think that's a floral. If you weren't um, an actor, what would you be? Oh. <laughs> and also for uh, like Michelle, I remember your old song, If I Was Your Boyfriend, If I Was Your Boyfriend. <laughs> I'm not an actor. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I would be a director. If you weren't in your current job. <laughs> Thank you. you. Yeah. I would be teaching acting. How about oh, that? OK. Yeah, that's what I was doing before I was an actor. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else have a other career? I'm an observer by nature. I'm always just kind of like watching and looking and seeing. So maybe a social anthropologist of some sort. Oh, oh. OK. okay. Love that. <laughs> I'd be a nun. What? <laughs> what? What? <laughs> that is not the answer I was expecting, I have to say. <laughs> 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 
of spiritual or a pastor or something. Like that. Oh, okay. okay, okay. All right, there you go. Like, like, some life of solitude and quiet <laughs> contemplation. Okay. okay. Yeah, I, I think I'd be under a Bodhi tree someplace yeah. contemplating my navel. <laughs> we need to do some meditation up here, clearly. Nick, what about you? Uh, hard question. I really feel yeah. like uh, I was designed to be and thrive in this industry. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, so outside of this, I think I would try to heal community in a different way. Mm. I think I'd be, you know, instructing yoga or something. I don't know. <laughs> some some community-based activism or something like that. Okay, okay. Yeah, I don't know. Last I thing. honestly don't. I'm the same. I don't. Mm. I don't know. Maybe working with my hands. Maybe like a. It'd be maybe a carpenter or something. <laughs> <laughs> oh, seriously. Okay. Okay. Wait. I have. I have. <laughs> I have donated time at Habitat for Humanity, oh. and I really enjoyed myself. So <laughs> it might be something like that. I like to get in the dirt and dirty, and I'm not afraid of any of that kind of stuff. Okay. So yes, building. <laughs> okay. Don't judge my I'm not, dream. No judgment. No judgment. <laughs> um, <laughs> Chaz, you got an answer? I mean, you know, I, I I started at 13 taking tickets at Sundance Film Festival. I just want to be around film and television somehow. Like I just I the best thing you could do is give me a night and just let's just talk about movies. So I would probably be working in a theater <laughs> so I could watch more movies. <laughs> How amazing this whole stage is full of people who are just walking in their purpose and that yeah. they feel like they're in the right place. That is something to celebrate. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Um, okay, um, we got someone back there in the red. <laughs> really big fan of the show. Thank you so much for your time. And my question is directed to the cast. And I was wondering, um, is there any room for like improvisation with like the script that you have? Like, how do you all go about like just going with the moment and what you feel in the moment? And then how do you all balance like harder scenes with moments of levity? You know, when you're playing a character for seven years, uh, or for however, two or three years, you sort of live in their characters. You probably, I'm not saying you know more than a writer, but you sort of do, <laughs> you know? So you would know exactly the flow of how that character would deliver that line. Or, uh, I don't know about, I don't know if he'd say it like that, or I don't know if he'd say that. I know what you're trying to say, so let me go ahead and say it, because I'm from the South. So I like, I, you might not be from around here, but I know, <laughs> I know the, how to articulate what you yeah. want you done. You gotta put your foot in it? I gotta put my foot in there. <laughs> 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 oh, <Wow. yeah. laughs> you have a showrunner who is so, who's so giving, mm -hmm. then she'll work with you. You yeah. know what I'm saying? I've been around some shows, like, no, nah, this is, you gonna say it just like this. Mm -hmm. Like yep. it's David Mamet or something. You're like, gonna say it just like yeah. this. You gotta say it like that. But when it's a collaborative effort like that, you know, you can't, you, you, that's the best thing that the actor can have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> uh, right here in the hat, in the front. And this will go to Miss uh, Michelle, and then, of course, Aunt Vi and Wood, and anybody who would like to chime in. <laughs> uh, music is a soundtrack to our lives. What song or artist did you lean on over the past seven years that allowed you to live in the moment and give us your best performance? Mm. Ooh, great question. You want my seat? That was a good one. <laughs> I'll share it with you. I won't switch. I will share. It. I will share. It. It's a good one. It's a good one. And Michelle, you're um, my one of my wife's favorite artists, by the way. <laughs> I appreciate that. I must. Have, I mean, this is all hindsight, but I remember in the beginning, again, using the voices. But then the music that I was, I found myself putting on, in the, or it would just come up in the shuffle, like Kismet, was a lot of Whitney Houston and Kashif for some reason. So, I, yeah, so I feel like that, this, if just in terms of the show, there's that 80s, 90s R&B that was more ethereal than beat driven that I find myself. And then that, the fact that it takes place in New Orleans, I'm a really big fan of Trombone Shorty. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh my God. And uh, yeah, and John Bat Bat Batiste yep. as well, just like so. And the spirit of that music as well, which is beyond music. It's beyond your ears. It's touching you in a different way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ms. Tina. Yes. 
I think you're going to be surprised by this, but um, I don't really listen to music. <laughs> I don't listen to anything. I don't drive in the car with anything on. If you come to my house, there's nothing on. And there is um, an experience inside mm -hmm. that I am engaged in. But I'm rarely listening to anything, unless you know I actually might uh, listen to a book or mm -hmm. something like that. Wow. Mm -hmm. I listen to people. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been just being down there so long. I've been blessed. I really want to be in the world of New Orleans, right? So when I've been blessed to hang with Shorty and be in the studio with him, with Manny Fresh and with Juvenile, you know, in the studio with him. So it was a lot of that when I first got down there. I said, I just want to be in the studio just. And I was playing a lot of uh, hot boys and a lot of, you know, tr trombone shorty and a lot of like, even, um, what's his, um, Stowe, what's my man's name? Dr. Hook? No, what's the, uh, what's the white dude that, uh, with a great voice? Dr. John. Dr. John. Dr. John. Dr. Hook. Yeah, Dr. John. A lot yeah. of that stuff. Even Harry Connick Jr. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I just yeah. wanted to really be inside of what it was and some Zydeco music and all of that, you know? Because I wanted to be in there. I wanted to be as if, a person who grew up to that music, and which I really didn't, you know, and just going on Bourbon Street and hearing those kids playing those drums, you know, you want to be, you know, around all of that. So, yeah, I was just trying my best to be involved in that whole, um, in that whole environment. It's a mecca. I mean, it is. You're, that's the, that's the seed in which all this we, we call our B grew. You know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For me, um, I would say during certain seasons, um, certain scenes, Lilac Wine and Wild is the Wind and oh, Bach. Oh, wow, yeah. Yeah. Bach? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Emotional, it's, you know, it's, yeah. you know? Yeah. Wow. I was like, Darla, she has, it does something to me. Okay, I love that. I love that. <laughs> um, I feel like my, what I listen to in my personal life is different from what I listen to when I'm approaching a character. So Micah, especially in those earlier seasons, I was listening to a lot of, I made a playlist of like black men who were expressing what they were going through at the time. So those early playlists were like a lot of Frank Ocean and a lot of XXX, like, you yeah. know, that kind of stuff. Yeah. And then the music became a bit more aggressive and rap oriented when Micah joined the fraternity and it yeah. was more like Drake and like Migos and stuff like that. Just to understand where my character was because we are not, uh, we're very similar in a lot of ways, but just to really tap in and drop in, I would make a playlist that, that's literally called Micah, you know? <laughs> that's dope. Um, I like to listen to a lot of um, movie, like music things. Mm -hmm. So like I listen to uh, Lionheart. I don't know if you guys know that movie. It's, like, um, it's really beautiful. And, and through the course of the whole, um, the whole, the journey of the little boy and <clears throat> becoming a man and finding this woman, I can find all kind of things that I can relate to, much like um, this beautiful person here. I can pick things out and um, just kind of immerse it into whatever scene I'm doing. Mm -hmm. It's just a really good soundtrack. So. A lot of Jill Scott, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't do That's Whitney <laughs> because, so when Michael Jackson passed away, I was really upset, but when Whitney passed away, mm -hmm. that, I, I can be in a department store right now and Whitney will come on and depending on what mood I'm in, I have to run out. Because <laughs> like even talking about it right now might bring something up. So let's go on and move on. <laughs> <laughs> yep. No. <laughs> I mean, for, for writing for Sugar, I, I often listen to Michelle's work and, um, and the soundtrack. I can't, I can't listen to words when I write, so I just listen to the soundtrack and uh, I listen to a lot of Chet Baker when I write because yeah. it's just like fast. Yeah. And it just feels like a typewriter. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all. Uh, but Miss Tina, if you could, what song would define your journey throughout your lifetime? Oh. <laughs> yeah, I, don't, I think I've heard the most amazing thing. And maybe that is not her. Um, that is not the portal to her mind. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, the, I don't, 
When? You, don't, you don't have, like, I don't think that question even. Silence. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> silence. Your own thoughts, your yeah. own inner voice. Yeah. 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 I grew up a little in Jehovah's Witness, and so there was a time where I didn't have a lot of music. It made me hungry. And then I love the periods where I have total silence, mm -hmm. which I do, like, a certain time of the year, I'll do nothing. No, no audio books, no music. Mm -hmm. And the clarity of the vo your inner voice is something that's it's, it's ineffable. I couldn't explain to you. Mm -hmm. there's, no, there's no word for it. It reorganizes. Yeah. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Remember, all the prophets head to the desert. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you to all of you for joining us oh. tonight. Thank you to the audience. Thank you. Oh, thank you, everyone, thank you. for being here. This has been lovely.